How is it that you make the mental mind sh shift mindset shift from being a W-2 employee to being a real estate entrepreneur? Today's guest, Jans Nielsen, is going to tell you how he did it and how you can do it too. Jans is a real estate investor and a high performance coach, and I'm really happy to welcome him to the show today. Jans, welcome. Thanks, Jonathan. I'm excited about our conversation today. Absolutely. So before we get into how you actually make this really important mindset shift, you know, from being told what to do and implementing somebody else's vision to coming up with your vision yourself and then holding yourself accountable and actually implementing it. Uh, let me talk a little bit about your background. So, uh, you know, I, I understand from your bio that you were an IT professional. Now you are a, like I said, real estate investor and a high performance coach. Tell me about that transition and how you went from IT to the world you're in now? Yeah, it was a bit of a stretch. <laughs> I started, I mean, I have a 2070 IT career, right? I followed the traditional path of education, work, serve, saving in your 401k and so forth. And it was great, you know, good life. It was a comfortable life, which I think is the real danger. Most people find themselves in, they, they're comfortable and they, they're like, yeah, this is good enough. They know there's more, but they don't really have enough pain to start pursuing something new. And it wasn't until my mid 40s, I was like, wow, I needed to, I wanted to, I, know, I knew there was more, I knew I could do more. I just didn't know what that was. And I was also kind of like, wow, you know, do I want to stay in IT for another 25 years? Or can I find um, something new? And that's really where the impetus to start making changes came from. And everything else I looked at looked like a new job. So it wasn't until I kind of stumbled upon real estate, uh, you know, seven, six, seven years ago that I was like, wow, this is the, the path that I can take that probably will allow me to create something completely new, right? So it was just this realization of what real estate could give you that was the impetus to start making changes um, in, you know, about, yeah, that seven, eight years ago. So let me ask you though, so you had, you know, a successful career, in IT, uh, you know, what, what, why was it that just didn't run out the string there? Like, what, why did you decide that you needed a change? A couple of reasons. I really want to be, um, you know, so I'm originally from Denmark, uh, been in the, the U.S. for 27 years, right? And as I was, as I was moving towards my 50s, you know, late 40s, 50s, one thing became very. Um, really hit home was that my mother passed away when she was 52 from cancer. I was like, wow, you have no idea if you have 20 more years, 50 more years or two more years left. So there is a sudden urgency to start living life more on my own terms, having the ability to go back to Denmark to visit friends and family more than the, you know, one or two weeks that you may be able to do if you have a W-2 job. Just the ability to just regain my own time, my own freedom um, to some degree. So because, you know, I, I didn't see my mom having the opportunity to go beyond her early 50s. And I didn't want to, you know, risk a similar situation where I had just been working and never really seen it, done those things that were important to me. So it really came from a deep personal place um, initially to start making changes. Um, and the, the other thing was like, you know, the technology I was really involved this in was kind of dying and I didn't want to spend a bunch of years trying to learn something completely new and get my, <laughs> you know, have all these, these younger people kind of uh, uh, challenging me and so forth. So there was that other side of it uh, as well. And what, you know, what though made you think that you could make this transition? I mean, I think a lot of people feel like they they want to make a transition to something that's more on their own terms. Um, and, and they may have a compelling reason like you did that you want to create more freedom so that you can go back and spend time, you know, back in Denmark with your the people you care about. Um, but just because you felt like you wanted to do that, it's a different thing to believe that you can do it. And I'm wondering where that belief came from that, well, this is something that you could pull off if you just figure out what the recipe is and implement the recipe. Yeah. And I think, you know, along with that kind of that awareness of it was time to make some changes in my life. I 
I did a couple of things, right? I started learning the, the technical aspects of what is real estate investing all about, right? And I had a very long, like a 10 year, very slow plan buying, you know, small units by myself for, for many years. That was the initial plan. But then I also, I was like, how are other people successful? You know, who, who is out there? Or, you know, as, as I think Tony Robbins says, you know, success leaves clues. So I really started picking up all these different, like, quote unquote, self-development books, you know, The Miracle Morning and High Performance Habits and um, Success Principles, all these different books that describe how successful people start changing their mindset. Because one thing, as you said, you know, you understand it from a intellectual, from a cerebral standpoint, how to invest in real estate, but taking action requires a whole new person because, you know, as, you, as they say, what got me to where I was, wasn't going to get me to that next level in life, right? So it was studying, it was connecting with people, but this really started to, to expand my mindset around what it meant to become a successful uh, investor. But, I, but I'm asking something maybe a little bit deeper than that, because what I'm trying to get at is I'll just give you an example from my own sort of personal life, right? So one of the things that I struggled with a lot was really like a lack of a lack of self-belief. I could I could, you know, reverse engineer the the recipe for any kind of successful business, but I didn't believe I could do it. Right. And if you don't, and I know that there's I remember, you know, years and years ago, you know, sort of back in Tony Robbins' his early Tony Robbins' early days. I mean, I'd sort of date myself. You know, I read all of his books back when they came out. And I remember one of the things that he used to talk about was like a key ingredient to success is the belief that you can do it, right? He had like three sort of three, I can't remember what the three steps were, but one of them was that you have to believe that you can do it, right? And so, and that was always where I where I stumbled because I didn't believe I could do it. I sort of achieved what I achieved by force of will and just sort of forcing myself to follow the steps but I was definitely held back and didn't achieve the kind of success I wanted because I was fighting against a belief that I really couldn't do it. So how did, how did you, did you ever struggle with that? I guess is the one question. Um, but even if you didn't like sort of what, what were you thinking? Like sort of what was your belief system like that said, okay, I can follow. I, if I know the steps, I can follow them and I'll be good. Like, just talk about that a little bit, if you would. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, Yes, I mean we all have limiting beliefs, right? <clears throat> I didn't. Did I believe I could go out and 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 buy? You know, did I truly believe I could leave my W two job through real estate investing? Probably not when it started out, right? It was a long winded plan I had because it felt safer to scale it over ten years, right? Um, so definitely, there's some limiting beliefs there. I think what really pushed me forward was putting myself in a situation where I would get so much. I mean, accountability or so much um, having to live up to other people's expectations, if that makes sense. So the mm -hmm. reason the, how I did that was basically by joining, you know, a kind of a mentoring coaching program and start going to events where I would see other people like, wow, this person can do it. And they weren't like, you know, a million miles ahead of me. They were just a few steps ahead of me. Like, wow, okay. So so-and-so have started to take action. That doesn't seem that far-fetched for me to be able to do it. And then align myself with people that were already kind of, you know, a few steps ahead of me. So when, when we did our first syndication, I, I joined a team that were, you know, doing their second or third one. So I felt like, yeah, actually I can come in here and start adding some values and start helping them. So I think there was that. And I felt like I had two choices there. I could either you know, try to step up and, and do, you know, level up to those people I surrounded myself with, or I could just say, yeah, it's not for me and then go back to my job, right? So it's really a lot about my changing my network, changing the people I hung around and just getting inspired by what they were doing, you know, but I didn't start there. I mean, I started by buying some smaller properties with my own money because I felt that was safe and, and not too risky. But when I wanted to go from that to, actually become make this a business that's that's really the approach I took um, and then later on we can get into that too you know then I hired a coach to really start taking additional um, additional action to uh, to make some big changes 
Well, wh- why did you decide that you wanted to make this a business as opposed to um, just continuing with the original plan of kind of buying enough houses until you set yourself financially free? Because it's certainly a viable path to do it that way, right? I mean, um, lots of people do that and and they have really great kind of lifestyles. Um, but w- was it simply being exposed to a larger vision that you could turn it into a, a business or was there something else that, you know, what was it that, that sparked this in your mind that you should shift gears? Yeah, you know, yeah, it, initially it was a 10 year plan to just buy <laughs> buy some houses and fourplexes and so, and so forth. Um, the shift was really when I started seeing what was possible, I was like, wow, I can spend all this energy at work trying to, you know, learn new technology and managing people and get a marginal increase in, in income, or I can see what's possible. I can, I can actually dream a bigger dream and then start implementing and see what's possible, right? I mean, I never really put myself in that position. Um, I was like, wow, here's an opportunity. And as I started seeing more people that were, that were doing it, it became more real. You know, and I think we have this tendency to put people on pedestals. We see somebody that's, you know, oh, they own a million units and all these other things. It's so difficult to comprehend how they got there. But I got around people that once I got to know them, it's like, wow, well, they just started, you know, five years before I did. And that's the path they took. There's no reason why I can't replicate that path and, and step up to that. So it was really just seeing the path laid out for me, having it, uh, making the decision that I really wanted to do that because it, it was, you know, it would stretch me. It would an opportunity to create something I didn't hadn't even seen as a possibility, and also, you know, finding some partners that all also believed that this was possible. So I think those are some of the things that really started changing. And then, you know, COVID happened. And all these other things that was a huge impetus to start making some new major changes in my life at the same time. What well, so? But what was the original? You know, when did you originally come across this idea of? I'm assuming you're talking about syndication, you know, um, did you like attend a conference or learn about it on a podcast? You know, how did you first encounter this idea that started this shift? Yeah, I remember it clearly. So I had bought a few, you know, a handful of smaller properties and so forth. And I remember totally listening to a podcast. And I actually, I was driving to work, I was carpooling with somebody and I, and I was, I said, Hey, do you mind listening to this podcast with me? So we were listening to it. And this is where I started under, you know, it was somebody that talked about syndications. I was like, well, this is what I want to do. Because suddenly I saw how you can start assembling the resources to buy some bigger deals. And then at the same time, I did start going to conferences and, you know, it was kind of laid out and it wasn't that complicated once you start figuring out where all the pieces were. And, and so a combination with the motivation and the inspiration to do it, my, you know, just putting it out there and say, this is what I want to do going to the conferences and, and surrounding myself with people that were doing it all, all became much more real. And I realized I didn't have to figure it all out by myself. I think that's one of the biggest challenges when we want to start getting into real estate investing or some other businesses. First of all, we think, oh, I have to do it all myself. I figure it all out by myself. And it becomes incredibly overwhelming. Here I was like, well, I don't have to figure it all out by myself. I can do a few different things that I'm pretty good at and then assemble a team to do the rest of it. And I think that's the recipe we all have to consider. Yeah, I mean, I, listen, I, I think this is sort of like a large problem with the idea of entrepreneurship in general that's kind of pervaded American society where this, there's this idea of like the heroic founder, right, who does it all. Because we have, you know, there's always the, that the guy that the press held, holds up as the hero, right? The Mark Zuckerberg or whatever, who did it in his garage, right? And, 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 and built it all by himself and then later brought in other people to you know, delegate stuff to. Whereas I think in almost all successful cases, what you find is that there's always a partnership and there's always somebody who's like the quiet guy behind the scenes actually making it happen. And you know, the guy whose face is on TV is actually just you know, is just generating ideas and is the, maybe the visionary, but he's not actually making it happen. Um, So I I always advise people like, Hey, the first thing you need to do is get partners, but finding partners is really difficult. Like finding good partners is extremely difficult. Um, And oftentimes everybody that you meet when you're first starting out, they actually all want the same role. 
right? And so that's not very successful. How did you, how did you find, uh, you know, partners? And have you gone through a series of partners, or have you been with the same partners all along? Yeah, I've had a, I've had a couple of different partners. Um, uh, I would say, and they've gone, you know, some of the early partnership was just we did one deal together, and then we sold it, and it was like, yeah, we we're that was fine, and we didn't really go beyond there. Um, but I think my current partnership was started in early 20, um, 2019, came from a conference and basically just going to an event. And I, I would always, so I'm a little bit of an introvert, but I would always force myself to like sit in, in the middle of the row towards the front to actually surround myself by somebody new, right? And I would move around, you know, if it was a couple of days, I would move around. So I would sit next to somebody new. I wouldn't like to sit to people, sit next to people I knew. And, you know, fate or power of the universe, whatever you want to call it, had it that I met my now partner at, at this event. And I was like, we started chatting and, you know, uh, actually somebody else knew him and it's like, you should meet this guy. Okay, cool. So, and, and we hung out and we chatted more and he was, he is more the visionary than I am. I'm more of the implementer, the integrator. And so we sat down and had a, a you know, chat a day and then we had some, you know, lunch and drinks in the evenings. So we spent really like two days just kind of get to know each other. There was just some sort of connection there. And as luck would have it, he was doing his like second syndication and He's like, you know, hey, do you want to partner on this? You know, and I said, well, I can be a co-sponsor. I can really help raise some money. I can do some underwriting, a few smaller things. I wouldn't like, you know, the, 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 the success of this deal wasn't going to hinge on me. It wasn't my deal, but I felt like I could, I could add some value there. And, and as luck would have it, I, you know, was able to, to raise some capital. I helped do some underwriting, investor presentation, all these things. And at that point, you know, we really got to know each other and the connection was there, right? I really trust him. I like his vision. I like his values and all this. Um, so that's where it started. And we have since done, I think, 19 deals together. Wow. So, so it has worked out, you know, not without challenges. I've had other partners and we've had some partners too that have been, that have been challenging. But I think we have a core partnership that really um, has been strong these last four years. So. Well, let me ask you what's maybe a little bit off the wall question, certainly a question I've never asked anybody on the podcast uh, in all the time I've been doing it. But um, so, I, you know, if if you read something like Rocket Fuel, right, and you go through the the quiz about what whether you're a visionary or, or an integrator, like I'm definitely, you know, the visionary type, right? And I and I I'm very frustrated by implementation tasks. As a matter of fact, before we got on the on the call, I was actually journaling just before about like how much I hate implementation tasks. <laughs> and, and so, and, and so, but, but I, I, I recognize that there are people who really in, enjoy that, right? Like, so I've been doing hotel deals recently and I partnered up with somebody who just is really great at implementation. And, and I, I always find it somehow um, like, I feel guilty about handing all the tasks off to to him because I feel like, well, th th all this stuff is so awful to do. Like, it's really unfair for me to be asking him to do this like terrible imp imp implementation stuff. I'm a horrible person for like relying on him to do all this stuff. And it's very hard for me to put my mind like in his shoes essentially, where like, you know, he loves having a project to implement and doesn't really want to think about the vision, right? Whereas like, all I want to do is think about the vision and I don't want to, I don't really, I just want it to happen, right? I want somebody else to make it happen. So as a, as an integrator, you know, how do you feel? Like, I, I, I'm hoping what you're going to say is like, you actually really enjoy doing this stuff and you don't feel like with your partner who's the visionary, you don't feel at all resentful of him getting to be the visionary. But but I mean, just sort of talk, talk to me about this. I, I want to learn more about how you how you think as an integrator. Yeah. No, that's that's a great that's a great question. I mean, I'm sure I'm sure your your partner thinks, oh my God, I don't want to be out there doing the things that it, that is required of a visionary, right? So I don't know if that's creating relationships, talking to brokers, talking to the municipality, but I don't know what you do exactly. But the, those things that 
you know, I don't, I'm not the guy that's going to be out there creating relationship with brokers. I hate calling brokers. I hate, you know, that part of it because it's not in my nature. I'm like more like, okay, here's something we need to solve. Let's go do it. So all this stuff, if I didn't have my partner to go out there and find deals and create those relationships, I would just be like on the right deal. So until I'll be blue in the head, right? So he's, he has the courage to take the action that I probably wouldn't have. Like, oh yeah, this looks good. Let's put an LOI in. And I'm like, oh my God, what are we doing, right? Mm-hmm. Let's catch up. So, you know, so he has the, he has the, the um, maybe the intuition, the, the, the feeling that this makes sense, where I have to convince my brain that this makes sense. And once, once we're on the same page, you know, he leaves it to me and you know, we have, a, we've hired a few more people because, you know, the integra- integration implementation is, is a lot of work, but it's okay because without him, I wouldn't have taken the necessary action to get anywhere. I would still be operating very small. Right. So I don't think there's any, any, any guilt there. Like, what do we, what do we, or any resentment, what do we find uh, enjoyment in doing and I find enjoyment in solving problems and implementing things and, and improving processes and so forth right that's my IT world I was I wouldn't spend 27 years mm-hmm. being in the IT space right yeah I mean that 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 makes a lot of sense it's just it's it's very hard I think to for me to you know as the the visionary type to to like really believe that people like really enjoy all that stuff that I can't stand, but I, but it's the other way around too, right? I mean, it's uh, it, I guess if you're if what you want is to have a problem to solve and you really get joy out of like figuring it out, you, you it's a lot easier when somebody tees up the problem for you to solve as opposed to going out and trying to like create a problem <laughs> to solve for yourself, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so. Maybe you need to talk to, ask your partner and said, Hey, this is what I'm feeling. What, what, what are your thoughts around it? Right? <laughs> yeah. I think it's, I think it's an important conversation to have as, as we go forward and lean more into this uh, hotel business. But um, anyway, so, so to tell me about your, your, your trajectory, I mean, you've done 19 deals, which is amazing in a relatively short period of time. So how did you, how did you ramp this up? Yeah, so that first year, you know, the first year in 2019, we did, you know, I think one deal together. And then it was in 2020, I think three and five, whatever. Then it kind of just ramped up. I think one of the things was partners, right? So, you know, it's him and I, but then we were able to strategically join with other people. So we would do deals in, in, in various markets because somebody would bring, would actually bring the deal to us. And we're like, okay, yeah, we want to, co-sponsor or we want to be the KP or we want to do something. So we were, we were very like open to partnerships with different people. So we did a, we did a bunch of different, maybe smaller deals that spread us out a little bit, but it gave us a bunch of, it gives the credibility of an understanding of how do you put a deal together, right? It created a platform for us. It, 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 it added to our unit count, not that that mean anything, but at least gave an experience in doing various deals. So we just kind of were, we were very open early on. We, we definitely, we have uh, limited that now because it creates a bunch of risk too, but, but just kind of that initial ability to say, you know, hey, you've got a deal, let's partner on it, let's, let's figure it out, right? And I think that's really where it scaled. And then we were able to find some partners that had a great capability to, to raise money, allowing us to do some, some bigger deals. Um, so strategic partnerships, I think, was really, was really the answer. And we would, you know, we'll do the deal together, but bring in additional partners as needed to, to, to close them essentially. So you guys are really the kind of lead sponsors, not, I'm sure you're raising some of the capital, but you're really delegating the capital raising function to others. And you're focusing on finding the deals, getting the deals done and then running the deals. And you've got capital partners who are raising the money. Is that, is that right? Yeah. I mean, we raise money as well. Right. But we do have some, we do bring in capital partners as well. Right. But we try to take control and we try to, you know, we have integrated property management, we have integrated, you know, asset management and so forth. So we try to take, have the majority of control with the deal, bring in, bring in the partners as needed on the various deals for sure. And so where are your deals? You said you're a bit spread out, but where, where are they located? Yeah. So the stuff I own, I own a handful of deals by myself. They're all down in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Um, because I live in New Mexico, we just started there. 
but the other deals that we've done are mainly in, excuse me, Cleveland, Ohio, um, and also in Western Pennsylvania um, in the Erie market. And that's just happened to be because my partner lives, lives up there in Erie and we've just been able to find, find deals there that made sense. Okay, so I really want to talk about this because usually, you know, I, nine times out of 10, when I interview people on the podcast, they're investing in Texas or like maybe the Carolinas, right? And <clears throat> there's always, you know, I've noticed a big, in real estate, there's this incredible herd mentality where like everybody runs to the same places. And for, for me, I'm kind of contrarian. And, and that when I see everybody running in the same direction, to me, that just says risk, right? I mean, people run in the same direction because they think it's safe. But when I see everybody running in the same direction, I think risky. So you are investing, you know, in contrast in some of the markets that a lot of people wouldn't touch, you know, Rust Belt, right? Uh, classic Rust Belt places. Um, you know, talk about what you found attractive in those markets, because it it really goes against you know, the standard common wisdom of you've got to have like massive population growth and you've got to have, you know, the most landlord friendly of jurisdictions imaginable and uh, all these kinds of things that people say, like, you know, if you're, if you don't have all these things, like you're going to be a massive failure and clearly you're proving them wrong. So tell me about why you, you like those markets that you're in. No, absolutely. So I think you can make money wherever you, um, wherever you want, um, in the sense that if you know what that niche is, if you know what it takes to, uh, to be successful, you can do it, right? You're absolutely right. Everybody is Texas and, you know, Florida or the Carolinas, but then you also have seen what happened, right? I mean, cap rates compressed tremendously. People are paying so much money for, for deals that, yeah, if you had, if, the, if, if rents keep going up by 10%, you may be successful. If not, you probably have a problem, right? So we're just in markets where it was just much steady eddy, right? And the prices were so much lower, you know, per unit. Yeah, there are some challenges with taxes and, and, and you know, <clears throat> landlord laws and so forth. But we just go in there and we find what is the niche that we can be successful in. And we found our niche, right, is like actually like in Cleveland, we're buying, you know, uh, properties in, in the center of the various parts of town, like Cleveland Heights or Shaker Heights, where these are hip areas that people want to live. The, the properties are old, they are tired, but they're in great locations, right? So they just need some money, they need some capital infusions. And, and we can buy portfolios of, you know, a 10 unit, a 20 unit, a 30 unit, and we just have, you know, accumulating hundreds of units in a, in a, in a, in a, in a certain area. So we've just found a way to make money in, in that market. I mean, some of our best performing deals are in like Erie, Pennsylvania, right? <laughs> Cash flowing really, really well. Yeah. We're not going to see a huge, a tremendous amount of um, appreciation in a short period of time, but then we also tell our investors, these are, you know, five, seven, 10 year holds, that we're just there for cash flow. It's not we're going to double your money in three years type deals because that doesn't happen. So other thing, if you communicate the right things to your investors, uh, then that's important. And now everybody who triple people's money in three years in in Phoenix, they're going to have trouble finding new investors because that's not going to happen in the next three yeah. years probably, right? So we just kind of found a way that that it makes sense communicating to our investors in a way that makes sense. Yeah, I mean, not not just that about not being able to find new investors to triple your money again. I mean, a lot of those same, those, what goes up comes down, and a lot of those deals are going to start losing money. And you know that that long term track record is not, it's going to just revert to the mean, right? They're going to have all those huge wins are going to be canceled out by some big losses, and uh, you know it, it's going to be hard to raise capital going forward once you've had handed somebody a loss right but um if you're investing for sort of slow and steady which is how i started out wanting to do that and then the market sort of ran away um i i, I there's a, there's definitely a a market for that and you know i was going to ask you, you kind of partially touched it on it but given the you know given the sort of relentless 
focus on podcasts and social media about Texas and Florida and Arizona, the, these kind of like star markets that that got so bubbly, right? But people made money very fast. How is it that you've been able to find investors who are willing to go to the places that are supposedly bad for investors? You know, what? how have you gathered that group of investors together? Because I know once you start making them money, it becomes easier. But at first, when you haven't made them any money yet, you know, how do you, how do you do that? That's an excellent question. And something I'm reflecting on <laughs> as you mm -hmm. asked it. Um, I think it's, I think it's, um, you know, trust a lot of my initial investors were, you know, friends and family and old coworkers mm -hmm. and all that. And they had seen me, you know, investing in Albuquerque and Albuquerque wasn't really known for anything, right? Just another <laughs> market. But I think, I think they more trusted, you know, think about, they actually trusted the track record of my partner had been doing it for 20 plus years in that market. They're like, okay, he has been successful. That makes sense. Uh, and they probably just relied on that track record of what we were doing. And a lot of these people are not, they're not busy professional. They're not like us consuming podcast after podcast and, and, and drinking the Kool-Aid. They're like, hey, Jens, knows what he's talking about. He has some partners that know what they're talking about. This makes sense. I'm good to go, right? And, you know, having invested multiple times before we started, you know, just sold some deals, but even before we started returning capital. So I think it's just building that trust, targeting people that, 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 you know, weren't like, oh, we want to invest in Texas or Florida or whatever, right? So, you know, yeah, so maybe that's the answer. That's that's a really good question. I should probably ask some of my investors why they chose to do that versus just investing in Florida or Texas. Right? You know, and a related, a related question to that is, you know, how how do you find your investors? I know that you have delegated some of the capital raising to other people, but it, in terms of your own investor base, how how have you built it? Yeah, so that's been built, you know, started out by friends and family, people I knew in my community, you know. Um, I was really into cycling, so in any bike ride, I would talk about what I was doing, and and then it it grew from you know um, kind of business owners and doctors and lawyers and you know that that I felt like had some money, so it's just kind of very slow, very um, you know, what do you call it? Organic, yeah. Organic, exactly. Um, and then you know some referrals, right? So my friend would invest, and he's like, oh, my brother has some money, he's like then go with him and then you know just very kind of that that organic thing of course you know i've been on podcasts i have i run a meetup you know i run a, a small uh conference so just slowly doing that right but i'm not out there i don't have a tiktok platform <laughs> i'm trying to get right. a bunch of investors so just very slow very organic which i like because i want to know who I, who is investing with me and making sure that they also understand our philosophy before they put money with us but just organic growth. Um, we are trying to get better at the systematizing it, but that's still a work in progress. I, I mean, I do think that the meetups are very powerful though, right? If you, for, the, for precisely the reason that you talked about, like if you get to know people, it, and I, I like I talk to people about this all the time. Like I have students who want to go and build like a massive email list. And I keep on telling them like, okay, it takes a long time to build a big email list. It takes a lot of money. And it's not, and at the end of the day, you still may be getting the same number of people who actually invest as if you have a small list of people that you actually know, right? Your conversion rate is really what matters. And your conversion rate on a small, a small high quality list is going to be much higher than on a very large list of people who don't know you, like you have no relationship with, right? So um, it, I, I've always advocated and I'm not the best taker of my own advice because I've gone down the route of like social media and building a big email list. But like, it's, I, I constantly think about going back to doing meetups because they were very effective and I like meeting people and I, it, I like giving them the chance to meet me. And, and that it's, it's a, there's a very good conversion rate when you actually get to talk to people in person. Yeah. It's all about trust, right? I mean, they're investing in you because they trust you. And then I think that the deal is secondary. Um, and we were having conversations in this conference we just had on this weekend. We had some capital raising conversations, right? And it kept coming up that, hey, they need to trust you first. 
and then they need to have an emotional connection to you and to that and then the deal comes second if you're trying to convince somebody that this is the best deal since whatever then you're trying to convince them and they start you know they start to get overwhelmed they don't you know they, they don't feel that trust they're not going to invest so trust you first and then the deal obviously the deal has to make sense but that i think i think that comes second you know yeah I mean, I've had this conversation so many times and I've experienced this myself too. Like when I first came into the business, I thought that getting people to invest in your deals was a sales function where you like, you had to, con you had to sell them on the deal and convince them to invest and like overcome their objections. And somehow you could convert somebody who didn't want to invest to invest. And like all that as somebody who's not a salesperson who doesn't like sales seems so overwhelming and icky. I was like, oh, I can never do this, right? And, and then I didn't realize that it's really a matter of building a lot of relationships with people who just like you. And then when you present a deal to them, a certain percentage of them are going to invest and you never have to convince anybody of anything. Right. And, and I, so constantly I'm teaching this to people that look, this is not about, because people want to know, how do you sell a deal? How do you sell a deal? I was like, don't, you never sell a deal. I never sell a deal. I never convince anybody to invest in a deal. I build a relationship with them first. And then I, I offer them the deal and they take it or leave it. But the, the it, it, it's a numbers game at some point. Enough relationships mean that you can close, you can raise the money, right? So absolutely. Yeah. Um, so I do want to, I, I, we've already unbelievably kind of gone through 40 minutes already, which um, <laughs> is great. But I, I do want to leave a, a little bit of time to talk about um, the high performance coaching. Like I'm really interested in how you got into that and, and what it is that you do. So maybe you talk first about what, what it means, like what, what do you do as a high performance coach? And then we can talk a little bit about how you got into it. Yeah, yeah. And as you want to maybe step back. So when, when COVID, you know, started in early 2020, I was like, you know, like a lot of other people like scared and, oh my God, what's going to happen now? You know, now I can't leave my job and we're all going to go bankrupt and all these things, right? And the best thing I did, I did hire my own coach at that time. So I hired a certified high performance coach, which is somebody that has been trained by Brendan Bouchard. You know, he's, he's one of these guys that has an amazing uh, program out there. So trained in his, in his methodologies, trained in his way of coaching, his, his framework. And he worked me through, my coach worked me through the ability to quit my job, move, start my business in the middle of COVID or not start, but ramp up my business in the middle of COVID, right? Had I not had somebody guiding me along the way, that would never have happened and all kinds of problems would have probably ensued from that. So I saw the power of that and I had been doing some mentoring in the real estate space, but I wasn't coaching and I saw the power of coaching is so much higher than mentoring and training people. Well, how do you, so what's the I, difference? What's the difference? I mean, I think a mentor is somebody that tells you how to underwrite a deal, how to write an offer, how to raise money. But it's all about me telling you what to do, right? Because I have been there before. So that's a teacher, right? A coach is somebody who helps you generate options for yourself. So Jonathan, I don't know what the most amazing life is that you can live. You know it deep down. My, my role as a coach is to bring it to the surface and help you generate options and make commitments around it. You know, I had somebody today I was working with and he wanted to, he's in the, he's in the single family, you know, residential sales. And he really wanted to create a white glove, high net worth um, experience for, for, for buyers that he wanted to give that high touch. I said, okay, what is that going to look like for you to do that? I didn't have that idea. It was his idea, right? But just generate the options and then create accountability around that. That's where coaching comes in because we know deep down what it means, you know. So when I when I went through that process myself, I was like, "Wow, this is amazing!" So I went and got my certification and have, I mean, I've literally coached. I've probably done a thousand coaching calls or more in the last mm -hmm. in the last two or three years, right? I work with, you know, a lot of really amazing clients, people that have quit their jobs, people that have done really well in the real estate business and so forth. So that's really I'm passionate about that because. You know, you can tell somebody how to buy a deal all day long. If they don't believe it, if they don't have the right mindset, they're not going to make it a reality. If I can persuade and influence somebody to say that or make them believe that it's possible, they will start to take action. And that coach is going to help you along the way. And are you, do you primarily focus on people who are in the real estate space or are you coaching 
other business people as well? Mainly in the real estate space, because that's my area of influence, right? Somebody hear me on this podcast and say, oh, that's, that's interesting. And they may reach out. So that's why I do, right? It's, they're all somewhere in the real estate space from multifamily investors to a few residential agents, but that's pretty much my, my niece of clients. And, and how does it work? Is this sort of like an open-ended coaching or is it a structured program that you take them through over a period of like a set period of time? Yeah. So this, the, the high performance kind of curriculum is a, it's, it starts by being 12 sessions in the core, core round of coaching. You meet like, you know, maybe two weeks, maybe four weeks. And then there was actually, there was actually four rounds in, in Brendan Bouchard's kind of curriculum most clients tend to, you know, tend to go through all four rounds of it. And then, you know, some even stay and then we just move to more kind of intuitive coaching through that. But that's what I love about the program. It's structured. So if you, if you think about a typical life coach, like, oh, Jonathan, what's going on in your life? What are you struggling with? Did you do what you said you were going to do? And it becomes very circular. In the high performance coaching, yeah, there's accountability, but we keep moving forward. You may have a lot of commitments you haven't fully followed up on, but we keep moving forward. So you keep pushing you in all these different areas around your psychology, your physiology, your courage, your influence, um, and your productivity. So that's why we keep pushing. And so going, the other question I had about this was, is there some overlap between like your coaching and your investing? Like, do you find that coaching clients become investors with you or partners with you or, you know, yes to all those questions. <laughs> yeah. 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 I mean, I've found partners through that because if I work with them for a few months, I know who they are. And I, you know, if we like each other, if there's trust, I may partner with them. Right. So there's been definitely partnerships built there. I've actually also brought people together to create their own partnerships and there's been a few investors through it, right? So it is a, it creates this ecosystem, which I love, right? I mean, this is the thing where it, I think coming from the IT world or any corporate world, we're like, I just want to get my job done and leave. You don't really care. Here, this is all about network connections, relationships. And the more you can build of that, the more successful you are, right? That's really the, 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 the biggest thing I tell everybody is you've got to find partners. You've got to build your network. That's the the only the best way you can be successful. And I think you've had the same experience as well. Yeah, absolutely. And like the podcast, one of the reasons to do the podcast is just, it's a great way to meet people in the business, right? Whether, even if nobody ever listens to the podcast, it's like, I get the chance to meet people like you and, and build my network and, and get to learn about people. And I think it's a really, there's, there's no better way to get to, learn, to know somebody than to interview them, right? And find out what makes them tick. So I really enjoy it. Uh, yeah. from, from that respect. Um, well, so we are kind of running out of time here, but I'm wondering, you know, is there anything that we didn't get to touch on that you wanted to, to touch on before we go? No, I mean, I think, you know, any, if you have that idea, if you want to change your life, you know, just trust yourself, get some, get some mentors, get some coaches, get somebody to help you make those changes. Because if you start feeling it in your, in your heart, or in your brain that you want to make changes, there's going to be somebody out there that can support you on that journey. Don't try to do it by yourself. It'll, it'll take too long. It's true. You can shorten the learning curve a lot by joining a, a mentoring program, like as the way that you describe it, as somebody who tells you what to do, that will shorten the steps. But the high performance coaching certainly will shorten the steps of getting your mental kind of outlook straight, right? So uh, probably the two things together would be very powerful. Um, so Jans, what's the best way for people to get in touch with you if they would like to follow up with you? Yeah, old school email. So basically my, my email is Jens, J-E-N-S at open doors with an S capital.com. And if anybody want to jump on a free call, they can go to open doors, capital.com slash call, and they can schedule a free 20 minute call on my calendar. So that's my, that's how to get, that's how to get in touch with me. Awesome. And that's for both the coaching and for investing. Yeah. Anything. If you just want to pick my brain about how to get started. I, I love that. Uh, I do this every week. So. Awesome. Well, Jens, it was great getting to know you a little bit on this call and I'd love to keep in touch and thanks again for your time today. Likewise. It was a lot of fun.